So, for, for, I, first thing I should say is I'm not Anthony Painter. I'm Matthew. So this may be a reaction to, by the RSA to me being given a job by Theresa May. They've decided that, you know, I've, I've gone to the dark side. They shall now not even use my name on overheads. Anyway, uh, I am actually Matthew Taylor, the RSA Chief Executive. It's my great pleasure to welcome you for this evening's special event. Um, can you switch your mobile phone uh, to silent? Uh, but if you want to contribute to the debate on Twitter, do use your mobile phone. Uh, hashtag is RSA Teach. Um, also, we are filming tonight's event and streaming live over the web. So welcome to all of us, all of those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we had an event this afternoon which was trending on Twitter, so we know there are lots of people out there who are participating in these conversations. Uh, this evening's event was set in motion by the government's recent announcement of a new set of standards for teacher professional development. Uh, as I say, many uh, of you in the room have spent this afternoon looking in close detail at the impact of these standards for practice in schools and classrooms. But this evening, we want to open the discussion out even further to consider a number of key related issues and challenges. Uh, we know that the quality of teaching is the biggest determinant of a young person's success at school. So how can we support teachers to keep improving throughout their careers? What does the very best teacher training and professional development look like? And how do we ensure that it's designed for maximum impact on the education and life chances of those who need it most? We're delighted to have brought together an expert panel to help us tackle some of these questions, and they will join us, and I'll introduce them uh, in a minute. After we've heard, or in 20 minutes, in fact, after we've heard from our uh, keynote speaker, uh, I'm delighted that we're going to be hearing from my good friend, Jim Knight, or to give him his full title, which he does insist on, actually, the, ro the Right Honourable Lord Knight of Weymouth. It's impossible to speak to him without saying all of that, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jim is Chief Education Advisor at TES Global. In his previous role at that company, Jim was the Managing Director of Online Learning, where he started what has become the TES Institute, a former schools minister, in fact, the longest serving schools minister of the Blair Brown government. Jim is now a member of the House of Lords and a visiting professor at the London Knowledge Lab of the Institute of Education. As someone immersed in thinking, writing, innovating around education, learning, and teaching, and who continues to be most engaged in how we extend learning opportunities to the marginalized and excluded, we're especially delighted, Jim, that you could join us this evening to share your reflections on the subject, teaching to make a difference. So please join me in welcoming Jim Knight. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Um, yeah, it was... Uh... Eleven years ago, I think, that I was made a government minister by Tony, and uh, for two years, uh, the brains of the government were Matthew Taylor in number 10. Um, in the six years since I left government, I've, I've now learned to think for myself, and uh, so these are my own thoughts, uh, Matthew. Uh, you can judge me later. Um, ten years ago, I was upstairs in Weymouth Library uh, in the meeting room, and I had a phone call, and the caller ID was unknown. I looked across at my constituent and my caseworker, and I said, do you mind if I take this one? They were fine. It's the Downing Street, Street switchboard. I have the Prime Minister. Hello, Tony. Uh, Jim, uh, you're doing a great job uh, at DEFRA, um, but I really want to move you to schools. Um, uh, you're with Alan Johnson, and Andrew Adonis will tell you what to do. It'll be great. Thanks, Tony. Constituent says, uh, good news? Yeah. I'm now the schools minister. Constituent says, um, do you know anything about schools? Well, my children are at school, and I went to school. Three years after that, similar time of year, in the uh, summer, a uh, nice summer's day, and I was taking a bit of a break from the office and walking down Millbank, and my phone rang. Caller ID, Ed Balls. Hello, Ed. He says, uh, hi, Jim. How's it going, Ed? Everything all right? He said, well, reshuffle's not going brilliantly. Um, John Hutton's just resigned from defense, 
uh, Gordon wants to know whether you know anything about defence. I said, um, well, I was on the defence committee for a couple of years. Um, I've got various defence interests in the constituency, if that helps. Gordon also wants to know if you've got any awkward views. <laughs> Were you ever a member of the CND? No, it's fine. And that effectively was talent management in government. Uh, Matthew will know all about it. Um, there was really very little... So I mean, when Ed rang me and asked me if I knew anything about defence, that, that was quite good. No one had ever asked me if I knew anything about schools or prior to that, all things bright and beautiful when I was a minister at DEFRA. So if you think that professional development in education is poor, at least it's better than politics. And obviously education is much more important than politics too, so uh, that's a good thing. Uh, actually, I won't go there yet. Um, about uh, two years ago, just over two years ago, uh, I was asked to give up frontline politics and take a job at, at TES as their um, managing director of online learning, as you've heard. And that was in order to establish a professional development and teacher training business uh, for TES. And so one of the first things, I don't know, kind of making it up as I go along that I thought would be sensible to do is to try and find out what teachers and head teachers thought about professional development. And so we asked you Gov to do some work for us. And don't bother about the boring detail unless you're really interested. But uh, one of the things that really shocked me, a bit like politics, was that uh, more than two in three teaching professionals, teachers, teaching assistants, don't have any kind of training plan. So here we are, schools, by definition, nurturing talent, most of them not in any planned way nurturing their teaching talent. But the most head teachers do undertake professional development. They just don't afford that luxury to their teachers. And only a third of schools were allocating timetable time for teachers for training. So clearly, there's something that needs to be fixed. And in many ways, uh, that's why I'm so positive about what David Westerman, uh, Weston and the Teacher Development Trust, uh, and then the government and all the various wonderful people who are about to appear here, uh, Alison and Philippa and Matt, um, have been doing uh, around this. Because teachers are hugely positive about wanting CPD. They want good quality CPD. They've got a lot to say to us, and they had a lot to say to us um, about uh, what they thought worked and what they thought didn't. And I learned a lot about the different sorts of CPD. I, in the end, characterized the different types as grip, grab, and grow. So there was the stuff that you just, and incidentally, grip, grab, and grow is not the title of Tom Bennett's new behavior course. Uh, that uh, we have just published uh, by, on, on TES as a CPD course for people. But GRIP was uh, the stuff that you just had, to, for regulatory reasons, to have a good grip of in order to be uh, a fully functioning teacher and not get into trouble. GRAB was the stuff that you just needed to get hold of quickly. And when we did this survey a couple of years ago, there was the grabby stuff that teachers wanted uh, because the curriculum had just been changed by... Uh, some wonderful minister in sanctuary buildings. Uh, and so they were desperate to get to grab hold of that training in order to know what they were supposed to teach. What there wasn't so much of, but clearly teachers wanted, was grow. The stuff to grow as teachers in their profession, to reconnect with why they came into the profession in the first place. And that's the bit that has interested me the most, because in the end, we know from the work of people like John Hattie, with his metadata studies about what are the most effective things in education, it's teaching. So of course we should be growing the uh, quality uh, and the range of pedagogy and so on in the current teaching workforce. And it's interesting looking at Hattie's work that all the other things that ministers get distracted by, like technology in my case, curriculum, school buildings, all sorts of things. They don't really make that much difference. It's the teaching that makes the difference. 
And then I've also been struck by the work that Andrea Slicer, the head of education at the OECD, has done. Um, I was at a presentation that he made in Berlin at the International uh, Symposium for the Teaching Profession uh, back in March, when uh, he talked about teacher professionalism as being this combination of skills and knowledge of peer learning and trust. Now, I think we focus an awful lot on skills and knowledge, partly because they're tangible, they're things that we can get evidence for, we can measure, uh, and uh, where there's a demand for it. We do a certain amount of learning from each other, but if I think of any other profession, one of the things that defines a professional is consistently and constantly learning from each other and developing uh, your skills and your knowledge and your competence with each other. But then the bit that then I feel we most neglect is trust. Now that's not just trust in teachers, which incidentally, obviously if they, if they were perceived to be more professional by the likes of John Humphreys, trust would grow. But it is also trust in each other, which is demonstrated through peer learning, and trust in themselves to at times deviate from what the standards might say or what the curriculum says, because in the end they know their learners better. And they know what their learners need in order to progress and grow and have their talents properly released into the world. So those are the three things that in many ways I've been thinking about in this context. And I'm hugely supportive, as I say, of the move to CPD standards, and we'll hear a little bit more about that, and there are people here who've been discussing that all afternoon. Uh, and I welcome what the government has done on that. But there is then just a little bit of caution that just doing CPD standards might not be enough. That just chasing after evidence might not be enough, because if we only train to the things that we have evidence works, and you know, a hard-pressed head teacher will only ever do that because they are very risk-averse and they will definitely only want to do what they know works. I think there are things that we will then miss out on in nurturing teacher talent. And that's then what I want to uh, talk about in whatever time I have left. And I'm informed in that by a great book which many of you will have uh, read or heard about by a guy from Harvard called Todd Rose uh, called The End of Average. In the introduction to his book, what Todd says is, uh, back when fast jets were invented, the US Air Force uh, suffered a lot of crashes. And obviously, initially, they thought that was a problem with the planes. It wasn't a problem with the planes. So then they thought, maybe it's a problem with the pilots. And the pilots said, it's not a problem with us. And so in the end, they commissioned a study. And one of the guys in the study knew nothing about planes. But he had studied everything to do with the data of dimensions and measurement of a human hand. And he had a hunch as to what the problem was, because he knew that the US Air Force at the time was recruiting to a standard size pilot. And everything in the cockpit was built to that standard sized person. And he knew that there, in all of the studies that he'd done, that there were, nobody had an average sized human hand. And what was happening was that pilots were having to overreach or underreach to get to controls, and with the extra speed of the fast jets, they were therefore crashing. And as a result, we now all have adjustable seats in our cars, because there's no such thing as an average person. And I have a worry that we design our school system to the average pupil, and there is no such thing. We have standardization across our schooling system, and we're talking about standards, but for humans, there is no such thing. The other book that I'm really interested in, and uh, I've read enough of, and I've talked to one of the authors, Linda Grattan, and I've spoken to Andrew as well about it uh, on more than one occasion, uh, is The Hundred Year Life. And I'm not going to distract you with the, the premise of the book, which is that, uh, well, I am going to distract you, aren't I? Um, that um, 
A child born today is more than 50% likely to live to over 100, and that there are massive societal consequences for it. I think Linda has done a talk here at the RSA. But there are big implications for education, but there are big implications for all of us in thinking about how we sustain what will become a 60 to 70 year working life. And as well as being a professor at the London Business School, Linda is a, a, a psychologist. Uh, she's done lots of very interesting study about what sustains us in work. And there are tangible assets that we build and that are really measurable and are pretty straightforward in some ways. Not that straightforward uh, to hang on to your tangible assets and you gain them and lose them during your life. But she also talks very powerfully about intangible assets. Things like your reputation. Things like the, the network of people around you. She calls them your posse. Um, your mental and physical health. Now, if we're going to hang on to teachers who are leaving the profession in droves, either to go and do something else or to go and teach in nice international schools in Dubai where David's flying off to tonight, um, they're leaving partly because they don't have the intangible assets in sufficient quantity. So I've then become interested in what we do as well as professional development that we should pay attention to personal development of the teaching workforce if we want to hang on to their talents. Now, 10 days ago, I was at a wonderful combined professional and personal development event in Venice called OPI. And, you know, to some extent, if it's in Venice, what can go wrong? And what you'll see in these three pictures is what looks suspiciously like a drinks party, because it is one. Um, I didn't want to put up the other photos of us socialising because I know there are some people who are at who are here and they might be embarrassed. Um, there's pasta making and then there's, there's a more formal looking professional development session uh, which Mackenzie Cherry from uh, Gradin led uh, as one of the options around some more professional development uh, coaching, in that case on coaching uh, itself. And what was magical about that experience was that combination that was peerless there were no keynotes. Uh, there was no one who was more important than anybody else. No one who was paid to come. And there was a genuine sense of us forming a community, uh, of creating a posse of intangible asset value that will stay with us all working in education from all corners of the globe, where we will coach, mentor, and support each other in a way that will sustain us more than any education conference I've previously been to. And then on Monday, a week ago, I was, uh, I posted up onto the private OPI Facebook group, um, view from the Uber of me uh, in San Francisco. And I very quickly got a response from Sandy Speicher, who's the head of education at IDEO, the design thinking company, who I just spent the weekend in Venice with. And Sandy said, oh, you're right by our offices. Um, why don't you pop in? So I popped in a couple of days later to IDEO. Now, if you don't know IDEO, they are, uh, in some ways, the pioneers of design thinking. Um, they are brilliant in helping people get into other people's shoes and design accordingly. And indeed, uh, they've done, uh, as an example, a, a brilliant program around shadowing students. Um, literally with uh, deputy principals. I just today watched a PBS clip of a deputy principal following a pupil around all day in order to really understand their experience uh, and their timetable so that they can design for it better. And one of the things that IDEO is doing at the moment is they set up a teacher's guild and they've applied their design thinking expertise into how we can really properly engage teachers in tackling 30 challenges and one of those challenges was how better to use uh, substitute teachers, uh, supply teachers. And Charles Shryock, I don't know whether that's a typo, Shryock IV uh, from Maryland uh, responded to this particular challenge with an idea that he couldn't sell in his own school to his head teacher. And that was around saying, well, why don't we, instead of kind of setting substitute teachers a little bit of work to lead, 
We'll give them a lesson plan that is simply about saying to students, oh, you've got a substitute teacher for this class today, so you should get on with your project-based learning. Get on with your project. And it was a, a piece of learning, a piece of teaching about how you get people to do uh, project-based learning and, to, and do that research and do a different style of learning, which in the end has meant in those teachers on the West Coast who then adopted it and liked the idea, those pupils are having a wonderful, engaging experience every time they have a supply teacher in, which is not normally the experience in schools. The brilliant thing about the way that collaboration has worked is that now Charles' boss has seen how valued his expertise has been by other teachers in other schools, and so now as a result he is being listened to and he's got a promotion, uh, which I thought was a beautiful story about how professional development and collaboration between teachers, which in the end is what we're hoping for from the college, uh, can really work. But in the end, the test of this, and I'll wrap up, is how we deliver for these kids. How we deliver for white, poor males doomed to fail, as the Telegraph put it 10 years ago, as I set out on my journey after that call from Tony Blair to be schools minister. And we know that whatever efforts I made didn't amount to much for those kids. And we need to do better for them, and that's why Theresa May referenced them as she went into Downing Street. And my hunch is that we're going to need to equip teachers with massive amounts of professional development so that they have the range of pedagogic skills, the range of interventions to deal with a range of individuals. Uh, and at the same time, we're going to have to personally develop those teachers in those communities so that they want to stick with it, so that they don't want to follow David to Dubai on his plane, um, but <laughs> they want to remain in the profession, in those tough communities, using and reusing the experience that they're gaining and disseminating their experience through teacher networks such as the College of Teaching. Thank you very much. Great. Well, that was fantastic, Jim. Um, and, and a kind of core proposition at the heart of it, so it'll be interesting to hear people's responses to that. We've got four uh, respondents. Uh, they could all speak for a very long time, but they've agreed to speak for four or five minutes so that there's time for us to open up into a conversation involving uh, all of you. And we'll start, uh, nowhere better to start, than with David Weston, who's founder and chief executive of the Teacher Development Trust which is the National Charity for Effective Professional Development in Schools and Colleges. A former teacher, David is a school governor, sits on a number of educational organisation advisory boards, and is chair of the expert group on teacher CPD. David. It's up to you. you can, it's completely up to you. I'll stay here. Thank you very much. Um, one of the delights of uh, having been a teacher, I was a teacher for nine years, and then setting up my charity, is I've got to go into lots and lots of schools. And uh, one of the things you see is an enormous difference between some schools where there is absolute joy and you speak to teachers and they are so excited about what they're currently working on and you can see their eyes literally gleaming and saying, I'm working on this, I'm learning this, this is not comfortable, it's not easy, but I, I feel alive here and I'm being pushed and I'm being nourished and it's wonderful. And then on the other side of things, you go into schools regularly. I go into schools and people sit next to me at a table. I'm asking them about, well, how are you learning? And they burst into tears. And it's as though sort of the, in the pit of their stomach, they realize I get nothing. I am pushed and I am pushed to deliver and deliver and nobody attends to my needs. No one is supporting me. It's all about just do more, deliver more, be more right, look better. And that is absolutely miserable. And seeing that, it really drives you and you think, well, you really want to make a difference and try and do something where all teachers can work in schools, where there is this sense of scholarship and joy and they can genuinely get better. So when I was asked by then Nicky Morgan and David Laws to chair this um, group, I was really delighted. That would be really rude. Sorry. But I just want to ask you a question before yes. you go on. Because, no, go on. No, no. Because 
those two schools, you go into those two different types of schools, will that difference be reflected in their um, attainment? Sometimes. Right. Sometimes. Sometimes. I've actually I... seen, I've seen schools that appear to have improved maybe quite rapidly over a short period of time, but it's skin deep, and you can kind of see it's all about to fall apart. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I got asked by uh, Nicky Morgan and, and David Laws and said, create this, and then there was an election, and then um, I got continued to be asked by Nicky Morgan and Nick Gibb to create these standards. And um, I had the privilege of working with this amazing group of teachers and researchers and so on, and we came up with these five standards um, and lots of other material in it. But broadly speaking, these standards say, number one, when professional development works well, it focuses on helping teachers learn so that they improve student outcomes. When we learn as teachers, we're learning so we can do our job better. We can help the young people learn better. We know more about what we're do doing. We can help solve their learning problems. That's the first thing. So a focus on improving and evaluating pupil outcomes. The second thing says with his uh, phone deciding to um, uh, malfunction. Never mind, I can remember these, I wrote them. Um, <laughs> the, second thing, the second thing, the second thing, and please someone tell me if I get it wrong. The second thing um, is using robust evidence and expertise. There are wonderful new pieces of knowledge coming out all the time about ways that students learn. And it's just not right we always keep continuing to uh, teach in the same way. And it's absolutely right that we say some things we've done before could be better, some things we've done before we'll stop doing, and there are new and improved ways of doing things even better. So this robust evidence and expertise, the best possible evidence, not just hunches. The third thing was getting peer support and real evaluation, sorry, real expert challenge. So this says that actually in our classrooms, we act as the expert challenge to our pupils. We really help them see through different eyes, see different perspectives. We support them, we challenge them, we expect a great deal from them. And when teachers learn, they need that as well. The fourth thing was that teachers need time to learn. It's simply impossible to say to teachers, come out, learn something briefly, go back into your classroom, go. What happens is those notes, those good intentions, they go into a box and you don't have time to come back to them. And it's just not fair on the teachers or the pupils. But finally and most importantly, professional development for teachers works well. We grow our teachers well when senior leaders make it a priority, where they create the right environment in their schools for teachers to learn and grow and be supported, and they make it a priority. This is not something that happens when we've got to the end of our list. This is something that happens and is deeply important for every single professional, not just teachers, all the others who work with them. So that was the standard, those five simple statements with lots of ideas of how senior leaders, teachers and trainers and experts and providers can work together so that we can help teachers learn, help students achieve more, and ultimately help the most vulnerable children in our society to overcome their issues and to have a wonderful education. Great, thank you. So from senior leaders generically to a senior leader uh, in specific, uh, Alison Peacock, who is executive head teacher of the Wroxham School and CEO designate of the Charter College of Teaching, a role she'll assume fully in January 2017. Alison is a member of the DfE expert group that has just authored the new set of CPD standards. Over to you, Alison. Okay, thank you very much. So, I'm about to finish headship. I've been a head teacher for 14 years in a primary school that I took from special measures to outstanding. And um, my experience throughout my whole career has been always about how can we put learning at the forefront, obviously for children and young people, but also for ourselves. And when I became a head teacher, my way of working with my colleagues in a school where hope had been lost was to engage them in a way that was all about how can we build trust, how can we build expertise, how can we listen to each other, how can we learn from each other, which is very different from a culture that's about deficit, a culture that's about blame a culture that's about losing hope. And it's horrible, isn't it, to hear the kinds of stories David's just shared of going into schools where teachers are at their, at their wit's end. I think now, having worked in my school for that period of time and having engaged in research is a time when I want to now do something across the system. And so my um, new role is as uh, the CEO of the new Chartered College of Teaching. This is uh, a body that's had a bit of a troubled birth, if I'm honest. There are people who um, you know, get quite hot under the collar about this organization. And I think this is because, I've been reflecting on this, and I think this is because there is such a need for a professional body 
for teachers that there's a sense that we've absolutely got it right, we've got to get it right. And so I just want to share with you what I hope we will be able to achieve as a chartered college starting from January. The first aim will be to create world-class professional scholarship routes for teachers in order that teachers can be the best they can be, but also to do this through engaging in dialogue. I'm convinced about the importance of dialogue and that there's no right way, but actually through dialogue we can really test thinking, we can learn from each other. So we need to establish a dialogic study route, a scholarship route for teachers that they will want to engage with. We're going to build a unique research and knowledge platform for teachers so that members will have access to research, but also to um, reports, to syntheses of um, reports. It's going to be non-ideological, and that is a real challenge in itself. Um, we want to open up the best classrooms in the land. We want teachers to be able to see each other teaching, to, but really crucially, rather than the teacher's performance, what we want to see is how is this impacting on children and young people? Because that's, that's the thing that really interests teachers, you know, what's happening to enable that child to learn. And we heard from Jim about the huge challenge across our country, particularly in some sectors of society. And as teachers, we need to learn from each other. We are the experts that we seek. The college, when it's successful, will provide a principled, independent, authoritative voice. This is so important. So although, you know, again, when we heard Jim's a very amusing story about what it's like when you're a politician and you get phoned up and asked to go and uh, be the schools minister. I'm sure there are many people in the room that also felt, oh my goodness, it, we always knew that was what, uh, what happened because it feels like that when policies emerge subsequently. And then um, fourthly, but really importantly, of course, you know, the whole point of having a chartered college is to improve the quality of pedagogy for all of our children and young people. And the way that we would do that, I think, is to engage with the best research. There's not enough research. Educational research is not as good as it should be. But that's a reason to actually do something about that. So I'm hoping that at this stage in my career, I can say goodbye to my school, very sadly, actually, at the end of this term, and then move into something that could make a difference. In education, we quite often look to Ontario in Canada, where they manage to achieve great um, things through collaboration. I would hope if this college works in 10 years time, people will, across the world will say, wow, look what happened in England. It used to be that teachers were leaving in their droves, they'd lost hope. They developed a new standard of CPD, they developed a new charter college of teaching, and now look. Thank you. Alison, I'm sure everybody, I'm sure there are lots of people in the room who know the answer to this, but I'm intrigued. What, you said that there are sort of controversies around the Charter College. Which is the most challenging of those kind of controversies and debates, do you think, the most difficult, what, what, the one that's probably <laughs> to be most difficult? Well, we'll, we'll keep it I, quiet. Yeah, <laughs> I so. can tell, I know. I think, I think there have been several things. I think people have been impatient. So the idea emerged and then it felt like it took a long time to get going. Um, people, um, wanted independence and there was a campaign that went out to say claim your college and not sufficient funding was in fact no funding was really generated from that and so that was a PR disaster I think the reality is um, people feel quite desperate in the profession and this is why feelings run high because they want they want to have that independent authoritative voice that the college will now provide and it's been a long time coming thank you so, uh, third, Philippa Cordingley is Chief Executive of the Centre for the Use of Research and Evidence in Education, an internationally acknowledged expert in using evidence to develop education policy and practice. She's an advisor to many expert groups and panels, including the National Teacher Research Panel. She's also Chair of the RSA Academy, Tipton. Philippa, over to you. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is that I, what I thought was so inspiring about being part of the expert group was to have some time with such wonderful people to think about raising all our expectations about CPD, not just what it means uh, and what it can do, but also what we give to it. Uh, I think we've had a long journey of low expectations from inset days to death by PowerPoint, all, all kinds of terrible stories David was telling some at the beginning of this. And it doesn't have to be like that. You know, there are schools who embed professional learning 
in making the curriculum come alive for young people, in uh, supporting staff. But we've got a bit of a Mexican standoff. That, that I looked it up on Wikipedia. A Mexican standoff's that thing where everybody's got, you know, uh, there's a great picture where it's tomato, ketchup, and mustard, but sometimes it's guns. You know, everybody's pointing a gun at each other, so, uh, and nobody knows how to get out of that until someone creates a third space. What I thought we were trying to do with the standards was create a third space beyond the poised mustard and, uh, and tomato ketchup to, to get to um, something inspiring about what continuing professional development and learning could be. And what I know, we don't know loads from the evidence uh, uh, about anything, as Rob Coe would say and was telling us all day to day, but one of the things that I think speaks really strongly from the evidence about CPD is that this core notion we need to take risks and unlearn some things so we can learn more deeply involves trust. And the thing that speeds up trust more than anything else is reciprocal vulnerability. So what I think the standards, what I hope the standards represent is a chance for school leaders to take a risk, to take a risk of looking silly by trying to lead continuing professional development and learning in a different way. For teachers to take a risk by saying, I'm going to unlearn some things, I'm going to try some new things, and I'm going to do that with other people. And side by side, we're going to take those risks. And for CPD facilitators to do that, to do that. because at the moment, CPD facilitators say teachers just want trips and tricks. You know, um, school leaders say, but if I just let go of control and hand it over, uh, and everyone will just talk about what's happening now, and, and so on. We can get beyond that. We can create a, a place outside the tension. I was very proud, therefore, of the bit in the guidance which sets out side by side what are the contributions that teachers and school leaders um, and CPD facilitators can make. But I've been incredibly struck by how everyone I've talked to who's talked to me about the stand said, they're great, I love it, I love it, and we're doing it all already. And I think, well, if that was true, you know, why did we bother and what was all that evidence we saw? And so I've kind of asked lots of questions, and I think what's going on is we're all reading our bit we're all reading the bit about what we're trying to do. And we're not going to solve this, we're not going to create powerful new experiences if we don't move, put, step into other people's shoes. If we're a teacher, we don't, we've got to step into the shoes of the school leader and figure out how to help them lead us really well in our professional learning. If we're a, if, if we're a CPD facilitator, we've got to step into the shoes of the teacher and understand how to make it personal and come alive for young people and so on. So we need to step in each other's shoes in order to get over the risk of horoscopes, that, reading it as a horoscope that everyone thinks is lovely but doesn't change anything. I think there's a big question for us all to think about. Is it a standard if it's not quality assured? There are risks in standards. They can set up lowest common denominators. Um, Jim, Jim reminded us very powerfully of that. But then the current system, government isn't going to do regulation. It's absolutely clear. So the thought experiment for everyone here and for all, for all of us is how do we create the conditions in which everyone goes, we want the standard? Actually, that's going to make things better for young people. And I'm going to show what that could look like. The last thing I just wanted to say was that um, I think uh, that we made a big mistake. It wasn't really a mistake. It was just something we couldn't do anything about. But it's my regret. And in three years' time, I hope it will be different. I'm not really very interested in the standard for CPD, if I'm honest. CPD is what we do to people. I want a standard for continuing professional development and learning that invites everybody in. And it's the learning part of that that helps us remember CPD, with or without the L, it's always got to be about the future. Performance review, it's about the past. And it's bringing those two things together that can make the standards really aspirational. Thank you. Thank you for Um, Philip, just one question for you. Um, in the standards, the focus, in a sense, is on what is supplied. I'm, I'm interested in what, what do we know from the evidence about what it is that shapes teacher demand? That is to say, what is it that leads some teachers to want to kind of reach out and to develop and to grow and others to need to be kind of pushed and encouraged to do that? Do we know much about, about that? Well, I, you know, for a given value of no, the answer would be different. But the thing that I think, the standards do try and, and capture some of this. One of the things that the Developing Great Teachers Systematic Review brought out that was new, we hadn't had from all the quality studies before, is this focus on aspirations. This is another thing we didn't quite manage to pull off with ministers. So if the standard's about the future, uh, if you talk to teachers, even teachers who are people talk this afternoon about people who've been there 30 years and who you know feel like they've been through all these things before. If you talk to them and give them a chance to think about how those learners' learning will look 
if their own learning is different. If you personalize it, if you make sure you're giving teachers opportunity to think about subgroups of learners who burn a hole in their heads and their hearts because they're concerned or excited about what the future will be like, and you make teachers have, uh, uh, you know, able to have the kind of conversations where they can make themselves reciprocal and vulnerable, what, the, what the, the systematic reviews were saying was, it doesn't matter whether they're conscripts or natural enthusiasts, tiggers like me, whoever you are, actually in, in the end it worked. It's being clear about what your learner's learning will look like if your learning's working and having chance to take risks side by side with others and letting the evidence about how learners are responding fuel and drive the learning. Those are the things that I think that create the thirst. Thank you. So, last but not least... Uh, Matt Hood is Chief Executive of the Institute for Teaching, a former teacher, policy advisor, and Teach First alumnus. Matt told us in the green room before we came in that Teach First uh, is the country's most successful dating agency. In fact, <laughs> he told us, and we didn't believe it, but he, he swears it's true, that you can get a Teach First baby grow. Um, <laughs> Matt is also a school governor and chair of the Brilliant Club, which supports access to highly selective universities for students from underrepresented groups. Matt. Um, so, c confession, I'm a beneficiary of that uh, dating agency, so um, I've got a, a particular interest. Um, so, I, I want to pick up on something um, that Philippa said about the evidence here of um, what we know works uh, and what we know um, doesn't work. And um, Philip is absolutely right that it isn't a huge amount, unfortunately, um, at the moment, and it's getting better and we're learning more. Um, but the evidence at the moment is, is pretty limited. Um, and part of the reason I believe that the evidence is pretty limited, uh, or part of my hypothesis for why the evidence is pretty limited, is because amongst um, schools and indeed organizations like mine that train and develop teachers, um, there's a pretty uh, fundamental lack of intentionality, both in what it is we think teachers need to believe, uh, how we expect them to behave, what we think they need to know, and what it is we think they need to be able to do. And crucially, there's also a pretty chronic lack of intentionality in how we think they should learn each of those things. Should they read? Should they watch? Should they discuss? Should they practice? Should they listen? Should they be coached? Should they be mentored? We have a, a massive array of design choices uh, in front of us. And part of my hypothesis that I'm, I'm trying to test at the moment is we fail to make, as teacher educators, intentional bets on both what and how um, teachers should move from A to B. Um, or, in fact, actually, um, rather than just not making choices, we make choices, but they're implicit rather than explicit. We say, well, we do everything. We give this huge menu of things to teachers as a teacher education program or a teacher education provider or indeed a school. And we kind of let them choose which things it is that they engage with. We do a whole load of things, but we half-bake most of them. Um, now, this is just a hypothesis. Um, I don't know if this is true either, um, but I've set out trying to test it. Um, uh, and I wouldn't claim to be a researcher. I'm a teacher. Uh, I think being a researcher is an expert profession in itself. Um, but I can ask questions and I can try to understand a little bit more. So um, uh, like Jim, uh, as he showed from his photos, I'm very fond of a, a junket or a boondoggle, as they call them in the US. Um, and so I've spent some time over the past year um, with a structured interview, 60 minutes worth, or supposed to be 60 minutes worth of questions. 15 or so, so far, teacher education providers, uh, and this bunch of questions that try to surface some of the bets that I think different teacher educators are making, uh, either implicitly or explicitly, depending on their quality. Um, and I just want to share, uh, in the time that I have, one, one very early um, insight uh, with you from conducting this interview. And, uh, to give you a bit of a flavor, I've got it here if anyone wants to grab me afterwards. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a whole range of open questions, but also some forced choice questions. So, for example, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being participant-driven and 10 being organization-driven, how are the participants' experience shaped? Basically, do you think your teachers learn best when you tell them what it is that they need to know, or do you think they learn best when they decide what it is to know, or are you somewhere in between, and where are you on that spectrum? I don't think we know what the answer to that question is. Uh, I'm interested to know 
the design choice on that, and about 30 other questions that these, that these uh, providers are making. Um, so here's the early insight. I think the worst providers, and in fact, most of us fall into this category at the moment. Uh, if you look at Philippa's research into this, the overwhelming majority of professional development of teachers in the UK fails to transform bad practice into good. It's a pretty depressing picture uh, when you look at it. But most providers are both unintentional about what they think teachers need to believe, how they want them to behave, know or do, um, and they are unintentional about how. Um, I say to them, well, how do teachers go about learning this stuff? And they say, well, what we do is we have 10 workshops. I'm like, well, why do you have 10? And it's because they have 10 fingers. And that's the level of sophistication that I think a huge proportion of what teachers are exposed to, uh, that's the sophistication they're experiencing. As we get a bit better, we start to get more specific about what, but how still remains unintentional. So you might see the odd rubric here or there that sees teachers progressing through things, um, but it's still this kind of vague group of largely described as workshops, right? We, we, we're still pretty unintentional about that. If you're really sophisticated, you might be doing, you might have read Teach Like a Champion, um, you might be doing a couple of drills from there, um, or you might have a coach who comes and sees you occasionally, but for the majority of teachers, that's not something that they experience. I think good providers, um, and DC schools are a great example of this, good providers are both intentional about what they think it is that teachers should be prioritizing and how they think they should do it. If you speak to Jason Cameras at DC schools, he will tell you that our priority for our 4,000 teachers is for them to learn about content-specific uh, pedagogies and content-specific knowledge, and they learn it through small groups in their schools which meet once a week and practice. We don't ask them to do anything else. Our bets are on those two things. I think the most sophisticated providers, and I've only met one of these, urban teachers, if you get to have a chance to look at them, they're in DC and Baltimore. They are intentional about what, and they are intentional about how, but they connect aspects of their what, aspects of their curriculum, with specific attempts at learning, at specific ways in which teachers learn. They don't use a workshop for trying to change how teachers behave. They don't use reading a book to change how teachers do teaching. They connect specific things to the appropriate point in the curriculum. Um, that, I think, for me, is the aspiration about where we need to get to. Um, I've got about 15 more of these interviews. I then need to somehow find some time to write it up, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to share with you at that point. But that's the early insight that I want to share with you from that work so far. Thank you, Matt. So, so, panel, I was going to kind of think of some provocative question to ask you uh, all before I open up to the room, but in a way, I just think I, want to, I actually just want to ask you how you respond to what Matt said, because it seemed to me, if I understood it, that what Matt said was pretty provocative, really, in terms of the quality of what is being done. So, kind of in reverse order, I'm just interested in people's responses to what Matt... I mean, he, he quoted you, Philippa. I always quote Philippa. There's no better authority. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that I think is that you might... I think I'd look through another end of the telescope. So I, don't, I think it's very hard to see fabulous support for continuing professional development learning if you remove the school from the equation. And, and one of the big problems about CPD research is that most of the research is done by researchers who are making the interventions from outside the school. So when this stuff all adds up together into a coherent whole, it's schools, it, you look at it from the inside the school as the professional learning environment and where they draw in the external expertise from and it's within the school that the experience is made coherent. And, and this is a bit what I mean about the Mexican standoff. That's why we've tried to, in the standards to set these things side by side. But if you only look at the school through the lens of what the leaders do, then you're missing it because all of the learning is done by the teachers, not the leaders. So, so you know, to get a richer picture, I think you've got to look at it. And of course, in America, the difficulty is so many school leaders are not teachers. They are admin, they're often known as administrators, not principals. And so, so learning about what's happening here in, in America is always challenging because of that. Thank you. Alison, any views on what Matt said? Well, yes, because straight away, as soon as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, I want to go and see those schools, and I want to know what's happening in those classrooms, and I want to talk to those teachers, and I want to give out those questionnaires. So, you know, we've got the technology now, haven't we, that we can have that opportunity to have a window into what's going on in schools and in classrooms, and we can listen to people talk about their practice. And, you know, Twitter has started to be a space where lots of educationalists now debate and find out about what's going on, and there's a whole kind of groundswell of Saturday events where teachers are taking themselves 
off you know um, to go and engage in CPD because they want to but I think the space of where we can actually encourage teachers to be brave enough to say what I'm doing in my room feels quite interesting other people might like to see this I think that's something that the Chartered College could start to work on and it would be great if that was international I, I would love to find out more Thank you. Um, so is a lot of practice right now really bad? Yeah, probably. Um, probably not, and not necessarily by design either. It's just that everyone's trying to do so much that they're just pouring in all sorts of ideas all over the place. Not necessarily very quality assured for that matter, but I've heard this is important. I've heard that is important. Do this, train on this, do this, do this. And pour in all these ideas and there's just no time for teachers to actually learn it and embed it. So uh, is the quality of design, you know, are we actually designing these things very well? Probably not. Um, do we come to decisions about exactly what teachers should know and learn and think? Well, that's quite a tough one for a lot of people because it kind of depends what you want your society to look like. Because if you're, you know, terribly sort of progressive, you might say, right, education is all about tearing down all that's been and creating something newer that stops people being oppressed. Whereas you might come from another political tradition and say, education is wonderful. It's about a coherent society where everyone inherits the same things and knows the same body of knowledge and we all have uh, authority and respect for tradition. And that informs the sort of teaching you want and that informs the way you train your teachers. So it's quite tough. Um, I think one of the biggest issues, though, is... Um, about the nature of expertise and we kind of assume that um, we either assume that all teachers know a lot already when people know a lot already broadly speaking you can get them to experiment with things in fact the best way to learn when you're an expert is to experiment with your existing knowledge and figure out how to change it but if you're not an expert if you're a complete novice then that's the worst way to learn because actually you haven't got anything to base it on and you need some clear concrete examples and you need good modeling and you need uh, people to learn. So actually I think that's for me the clear distinction we need to make. Let's start off and say where are teachers on their journey from being novices who don't know a lot to being experts who know quite a lot already and let's get the right sort of learning in place for them. Let's synthesize the research really carefully and say what should be the things that do seem to help most teachers make the biggest difference and admit there are some things where it doesn't actually seem to make a huge amount of difference. Focus on a few things, focus on the right design for the right level of the teacher's journey and I think we might circumvent a possibly a waste of time with a big philosophical debate about what should all teachers know and particularly what should all teachers think which I think could be a very complicated one. Jim. So Matt, you started with limited evidence of what works. I mean, we know teaching works. It's just a curiosity that we then don't precisely know what works within teaching. Um, but it's, it's good that we know that teaching works. Um, and I th my worry with what you say is where trust in the profession comes in and at what point you hand over to trust. Because if we're intentional about what teachers should do and how they should do it, then there's a there's a little bit of a top-down implication to that, which I would worry about as a, a sustainable long-term strategy, if you like. It's something that you might want to do as you are seeking to improve, um, but then only as long as you connect it with learners. And there are some dangers in all of this that we work out from evidence that this sort of teaching works. It only works with those sorts of learners. And you kind of want the... It's now possible, in a way that it never was before, to think about individualized teaching and learning. And to some extent, that's the message out of Todd Rose's book, um, is to say, we could now start to understand what teaching works for particular sorts of learners. And then as a teacher, try and then understand what sort of learners you have and what sort of uh, pedagogies and interventions work for, that, for my sort of class. That's exciting. Can I, can I respond? Uh, yeah, briefly, and then I'm going to bring, uh, we, bring the room in. Yeah. But, but just a, a brief response. So that, this is a fascinating uh, discussion about this particular spectrum, which I just happened to, uh, uh, to put out there. And the, so let me remind you, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being participant-driven and 10 being organization-driven, right, there is a, a design choice, like an explicit design choice from, from you, uh, certainly you at the end of the panel, Jim, that you're like, well, I, I think this needs to be learner-driven. And... What I want to get to is, is that right? Like, because I, I personally am not convinced that that's the right thing to do. And I think what we sometimes do is we worry about patronizing teachers or we worry about disengaging teachers. And so our response to that is to give them total autonomy over what it is they go about learning. And then the consequence of that is that they don't learn very much. Mm. Um, and I think you can do both. I think you can say to teachers, hey, 
to new teachers, let's say, hey, here's a really good way of standing in a doorway. Right? I can spend 20 minutes with you teaching you how to stand in that doorway so kids enter and leave your classroom uh, in the most effective way possible. And I can do that without patronizing you, but it is organization driven. On my program, like, I am like a 9.8 organization driven for new teachers. Like I just tell them what it is that's going to make them, or at least what it is that we believe is going to make them really effective. And I could be wrong on that, and we hold that lightly. And if we are, then I'll let it go and I'll try something else. But my worry is if we always talk about what's right for all teachers, we're never going to come to any agreement, and then we remain in this unintentional space where nobody really wants to put a stake in the ground. Right. I think it requires some more people to put more stakes in the ground, and then Rob can come and test which of our stakes is any good. <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. Um, okay, so who wants to uh, ask a question, make a point? Um, particularly interested in stories of terrible CPD or brilliant mm -hmm. CPD. You know, anecdotes are always welcome at this time of the evening. Um, or are you all completely phased out by the quality of the conversation that we're having up here? Um, yes, thank you very much. At the back of the room. Um, just thinking about the last... Tell us, tell us who you are. Sorry. sorry, my name's Chris Bolton. I'm from Teach First and formerly a, a teacher as well. And just thinking about the last couple of points around... Sorry? Have you got the baby growth? <laughs> Have you got the baby growth? It's fine, it's fine. It's, the, the moment has passed and it's a personal, and it's a personal question. <laughs> Move on. Sorry, go on. No. Not yet. Uh -huh. um, yeah, the last two points were made, one about trust and one about autonomy. And the story that came back to mind, I can't remember where I read it, so I can't reference it, sadly. But it's looking at the, the medical profession. And the argument that would be made is that doctors today have far less autonomy than they would have had 100 years ago, but far more trust as a consequence of that. And if anybody would like to respond to that, you're welcome to. I just wondered what that means for, I guess, the point you were making towards the end, Jim. If, um, if, if Matt is right in saying that early, certainly in the early stages we want less autonomy and your concern was well, what does that mean for trust, does it mean more trust in the end? Okay. Uh, other points? Other questions? Um, my goodness. Ah, oh, very good. I can't imagine that's right. I'm a former teacher and I now work in higher education and I was absolutely driven out by, um, I can't even begin to make the long list of things that dropped me out of, of schools and I was really interested in terms of what I was expecting to hear today and I was very enthused by it but nothing you have said will ever get me back into a classroom again. Um, and I find myself in a situation where I'm in higher education and I'm so demoralised by the commercial model in higher education in the UK. So I don't know where I'm going to go after this. But I think what's really interesting Finland. is Finland. Everyone just, just go to Finland. Everything, <laughs> just, think, <laughs> everything's good in Finland. Oppie, I want to go to Oppie. Um, <laughs> but what I would have liked to have heard maybe, I still think there's so much emphasis on what teachers are expected to do. And all of you, I think, in terms of the way forward for CPT is for teachers to have more trust, less trust, teachers to do this, teachers to do that. And with the rapid rate of change in society, should CPD not be widened to look at how we bring in expertise from outside? Why are we expected to do everything? It's why I left. And I just don't, well, I know that your, your time here is very short, but I'd love to see how we can tap into expertise in our communities. Uh, what are the models around that? Um, and how can we, how can communities collaborate with the school? Okay. What's your name, sorry? Uh, Joanna Norton. Very good. Oh, no, there's suddenly loads of hands. So I'm going to take this one and then this one. And then this one, and I'm going to bring the panel in, and then we're going to finish. Okay, so panel, you'll have had five points. Just pick a couple of them at the end. Okay. Yeah, good evening. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, to tell you my name, I'm Vivian Durham. I have been a head teacher for 12 years in central London, 11 to 18 school, school governor for 20 years, school inspector since 1999. I don't really recognize the profession you're representing here. I completely agree with David. I agree with some of what Jim has said. I think. As a school inspector, for a start, schools are self-reflective. It's a category in inspection. School leaders teach. 270 of them are meeting right now as we speak in Stratford. If you haven't been, uh, particularly Alison and Philippa, to the Tony Little Centre for Learning and Innovation, I strongly suggest you do so. It's a pedagogic centre. It is outstanding. Schools want to teach well. I have never met a teacher who isn't a magpie, who loves learning. Great teachers love learning. They want to do a great job. 
I'm not saying we're great, we are complacent at our peril, but I think the best schools, and there are many of them in this country, are quite simply outstanding places of CPD. We do it naturally. In my school, every year, we had five full days of it. At least two of those were focused totally on teaching and learning. And we all observed each other, and I taught. So I think there's some good stuff going on. We need to look at the worst stuff, I know that, but don't ignore the good stuff. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, there were two other. That's right, that's right, back of the room. Back of the room. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. My name's Marion Long, and I've got an organisation called Rhythm for Reading that does provide a bit of CBD. Um, I would just like to ask the panel, really, um, whether they're interested in the grassroots movement that Alison mentioned, whether they would attend some of the Saturday events, whether they have already, and what their perceptions of those are. Thank you. Okay, and then there. Um, okay, I'm Barbara Blyman. I work for the English and Media Centre, which is a teacher centre that produces uh, lots of materials and resources for schools. It's been going since the 1970s. It was originally the ILEA Teacher Centre for English Teachers. So I've got a very, very long history. I was also a head of English. So I've got a very, very long history of having worked within CPD. I thought... Um, so many different things raised by a fascinating set of presentations. But I wanted to pick up on the whole question of research and research-led CPD and on the really, really interesting things that I thought David was saying about expertise and about, you use the word expertise, you use the word modelling. Um, and I just wanted to sort of sound a kind of cautionary note about research, really. I mean... As we all know, research means so many different things to different people. And the randomized controlled trial type of research that so much um, research at the moment has to kind of uh, go down that route. I mean, uh, as well as kind of a huge range of different sort of people producing odd books and different things that people refer to. I mean, you can, you can watch the kind of cycles of changes and tra changing trends going on. But in terms of the thousands of teachers that I've seen in terms of expertise, what makes a difference to them, I think, is having a set of principles, um, the expertise of those around them, really, really good heads of department, fantastic heads and head teachers and senior management, who allow them to find a way of steering a course through all of that. And I, and I do think there's a real danger that we lose track of the fact that judgment expertise, um, passing on knowledge and understanding that can allow you to sort of tailor and change and adapt for different kinds of pupils, for different kinds of circumstances, for different governments, for different initiatives and so forth. So I would hate to see a system in which of, of CPD in which that kind of um, ability to kind of draw on the expertise from the past and from past experience is sort of thrown over in favour of kind of, you know, what happened to get the latest sort of uh, results for a set of, you know, a set of um, uh, results for, you know, A to Cs or whatever it mm -hmm. is. There's something mm -hmm. much, much deeper that's at stake here from my point of view. Great. Thank you very much for that. So, so panel, um, we've got we're going to five or six minutes to go, so just pick out a couple of those points. I'm going to add my own question. Um, uh, feel free to ignore it. Uh, I'm just interested in the degree to which you think that schools having a core theory of pedagogy is an important part of all of this. That is to say that the, whatever CPD the teacher is doing, there's something to set it against. Does this confirm, does this challenge the kind of core idea of pedagogy which my institution has. Does that matter, or perhaps I've got something wrong in even asking the question? I don't know. So we'll start with you, Matt. Pick, pick two or three of those points. Um, so so I'll, respond, I'll respond to yours. Um, I think it's crucially important that teachers understand the theory of learning that they're experiencing, and the closer that theory of learning that they're experiencing aligns with the theory of learning in their school, the better off they're going to be, and this is Philippa's point of alignment. If you're working in Michaela, uh, school in West London, you are going to, should be experiencing a very different type of teacher education pedagogy to working in School 21. I think that alignment is important. Um, I want to take the point just about trust and uh, teacher burnout. Um, 
I genuinely think part of the challenge here is that we um, don't equip teachers with the knowledge and skills that they need in order to be successful in their jobs. And, um, and part of that burnout challenge is uh, certainly in the school where I've been a school leader in Morecambe in Seaside Town in the Northwest, our biggest challenge is lots of our teachers just aren't equipped to do the thing that we ask them to do every day. Um, and that's, that was on me, right? Uh, we needed to step up how we were supporting and training those and developing those teachers for a specific purpose so that we were able to alleviate some of those things. I don't think, um, uh, I don't think you can uh, solve this teacher workload, teacher burnout issue without looking at CPD as part of it. I just don't think it's possible. Thank you. Philippa. Um, the theory and research bits. Um, I, I, think that, that I think we tend to talk research and actually we're talking partly about theory and we're talking partly about research and evidence that teachers are collecting as part of their learning and partly the work of teachers who are scholars and it's exciting to hear Alison talk about teachers and scholars and partly about the research coming from the public domain. They're all very different things, they all matter. But I think we've been too atheoretical for too long and I, I, I think developing great teachers had lots of reason to argue for engaging with developing theory and practice side by side. Because if we just show teachers with intention things they should do, but don't give them chance to figure out why they might or might not work for these two very similar learners and these different ones, they're condemned to use them in a mechanical way. So, you know, it's absolutely fundamental to professional identity to work on theory and practice side by side. So the grassroots... Can I just understand? Yeah. Is that, so let's just... Uh, yeah. Do I, I, you agree? You I, agree? I, I agree. I you agree? You so it's not just about theory. telling teachers yeah. what... Teachers have to understand why it yeah. is you're telling them... I just them think you learn yeah, theory in a different way to the okay. way you learn practice. Okay. You okay. shouldn't learn them both the same way. Okay, so the second thing I want to say is that I think you have to, this actually it's a new point partly, but it's partly to yours. The research we've been doing in our very big data sets for 26 schools serving very vulnerable communities would say to me that for schools serving very vulnerable communities, there looks like a really good bet and hypothesis that having a shared language and model of pedagogy between the teachers does a great thing. It frees up their time and attention to focus on making the links with the community and making the curriculum come alive and mean something to the children they support. And, and that's, that seems to me incredibly important and very liberating for teachers. So having a model and understanding what its purpose is, I think really does matter under those circumstances. I don't have evidence everywhere, but for our most vulnerable kids. So let me give you one quick example. In those schools, many of them would delay very complex pedagogies, really complex forms of collaborative group solving, even though it would be easy and the English department would love, love to do it, until they were absolutely sure that every vulnerable student really, really was skilled in that pedagogy. Because if you don't do that, if you introduce complex problem solving in group work, but, but, but the most vulnerable kids can't survive, in, they haven't got the social skills to do that, you just set them off into a vicious circle before you start. So the teachers collectively decide to delay pedagogies for that. I mean, those kind of uh, models, that I, think we need, we, I think we know enough to think we should tr be trying that for school solving very vulnerable communities. Beyond that, don't know. Thank you. Alison. I absolutely agree. I think, you know, having principle at the forefront is really uh, powerful and important. Um, in terms of the Saturday events, the Learning First events were started from some tweets by me saying, why don't we get together and talk about assessment? And they've just carried, and I'm at every one of them, so yes, so I've given up Saturdays. Um, in terms of stories of hope and um, the brilliance of the profession, I'm absolutely there. I mean, I would love to come and see your school. I'd love to come and visit the, the Tony Little Centre. You know, I'm absolutely about, let's find the best there is, but we need to hear more of it. We need more stories of positivity. This afternoon in our session, we had a surgeon who joined us, a College of Surgeons, and he listened while I was um, sharing an example of a plumber who was talking about how he was using Facebook as an assessment tool so that when his students were learning about plumbing, instead of just looking at the workbooks that he'd got set out, they were actually able to bring their films of what they'd been working with, you know, real houses, real carpets, real dogs that would go missing when you do the plumbing, that kind of thing. And um, the surgeon said to me at the end of the session, we could really learn from that. We could really learn from that strategy. And I thought, hallelujah, at last, the medical profession learning from the teaching profession. We need more stories of that. Very good. Thank you. David. 
Um, so, uh, so many. I'd like to talk about all of it. I love talking about CPD. Um, I mean, the, the big issue, we've got this idea, which is just wrong, that you can easily measure how good a teacher is, and you can go in, you can just make some measurement, observe them a couple of times, and look at their books, and just say, right, this teacher is this good, generically CPD them until they're better, and it drives people out of the profession, and it's appalling. It's awful. Um, it's also nonsensical. There's no evidence that it works. So actually, when we're then, if people then hear, oh, well, you're going to use research and big randomized control trials, they then say, oh, this is going to be another hammer. You're going to hear, right, we did a big randomized control trial about a, a feedback. I know how good you are. I know what's best for you. Hammer, hammer, hammer. Use feedback because I told you to. And that's exactly the opposite of what professional development should be about, which should be about really giving teachers tools, not hitting them with them, and say, look, you need to have evidence-based tools. You know, we, get, we help doctors and surgeons do wonderful things because we put the expertise into the tools and then we train them how to use them. We don't just say, you must repeat the following slices exactly. It doesn't matter which the patient is. That's just the way you do it. So I think there's something about that. Grassroots is very exciting and there is something happening in England which doesn't seem to be happening pretty much anywhere else in the world where these Saturday events and research ed and I go along to those or learning first and lots of these events people get together there is a buzz and excitement people are using their time in the evenings on Twitter they're setting organizations up something is happening that is truly special and that is engaging the research communities and the teaching communities and I do think that in 10 years time people are going to say wow, how can we be more like England? Because I genuinely think we can turn around this spiral of doing two teachers and getting it done by them instead. My goodness, doctors learning from teachers, people saying, how can we be more like England? It's... <laughs> We're taking off, Jim. Oh. Just a little bit of a word of caution. You know, be, be careful um, that, you know, that, that Twitter world, you know, how do we scale it out of that? Not, you know, most teachers aren't on Twitter. Most teachers don't go to those events. How do we get it out of that echo chamber into the mainstream? Uh, obviously through TES. Um, the, three, the three very quick, so Barbara, um, I'm not some kind of uh, Govian post-expert type person. So I think um, experts are really important. They're, the external research is important, but the internal expertise of experience and of uh, teachers uh, is equally important. And there's a balance to be struck around how we listen to uh, both of those. Um, uh, Chris, uh, the less autonomy, more trust uh, point is very well made. And I think it depends where you are in your professional life. And obviously, as an initial uh, teacher, as a, a teacher at the beginning of your career, um, I think you want the security and the support of being given less autonomy and uh, that's how you build trust in yourself and build the trust of your colleagues but over time you need more autonomy and you need to find your own way um, and you know as ever beware the false dichotomy the road to educational hell is paved with it as Michael Barber once said um, and finally Joanna um, I absolutely agree around broadening the amount of expertise that's coming into schools. Uh, you know, if, when I think about those coastal communities, I represented um, the coastal community of, of Weymouth and Portland. Um, how are we going to lift those low aspiration uh, working class, especially uh, white boys? It's not just about their educational success because th those, you know, especially if we bloody bring, bring back grammar schools, those that are successful as a result of solely school interventions will in the end just be exported out of those communities. They'll go to university and they won't go back to those communities because the work that they are then uh, ambitious to do is not in those communities. We are only going to make the job of those schools in those sorts of places sustainable and possible by lifting whole communities. So we need schools to be externally engaging with those communities and those communities engaging with schools in turn and create the smart town alongside smart cities like London that people want to live in work and work in who are smart and educated. Jim, thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, we've been talking about schools. Just to alert you to the fact that uh, this is very much education week for the RSA. Tomorrow we'll be talking more about further adult, edu adult education. We're releasing a report, a very good report, um, uh, which is advice to a mayor who wants to create a truly learning uh, a city. We're, we're inventing a, a virtual city in order to make our case, which will be available for you to peruse for our recommendations tomorrow. And also tomorrow night, we've got Simon Nelson, Chief Executive of Future Learn, 
talking about how it is we can create cities of learning, and you can watch that event online, I think. It's full, though, isn't it? It's full, but you can watch it online. So lots more interesting stuff coming out of the RSA tomorrow. But whatever we do tomorrow, it will be hard to match what we've done today because this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. So please, before you leave, join me in thanking Matt Hood, David Weston, Alison Peacock, Philip Accordingly, and Jim Knight. Thank you.